please join me in welcoming Dr. Nick Turan. Thanks for joining us tonight, Nick. Hey, of course. Thank you so much for having me. Good evening, everybody. I, I'm very excited to be here. This is a, a uh, somewhat admittedly unconventional topic, but I hope, uh, I hope it will be enjoyable. Um, just given the title, I, I think you sort of know what to expect, um, but uh, it should be hopefully interesting and thought provoking. Um, uh, a couple disclaimers. One is that this, th this talk tonight is coming more from the whatisnuclear.com personal side of my profession. Um, and so therefore the, what I say doesn't represent the opinions necessarily of my employer. And I do want to acknowledge two of my colleagues uh, whose passion has really helped me build an interest and, and uh, excitement about this topic, namely Robert Petrosky and Brian Johnson. And uh, before, before I jump into the slides, I do want to mention that the main driver for this and why we're talking about kind of an unconventional issue like this is, is driven by the, the concern of climate change. And that's actually how I got into nuclear engineering. I, I came in at the turn of the millennia and um, really was looking for something to do with energy. And I happened to be at University of Michigan. They happened to have a pretty good nuclear engineering department. And I put it together and thought, well, nuclear, that's something that could help with climate change, but it needs work. So maybe maybe there's an opportunity for, for someone like me to get in there and do something interesting. So anyway, that's, that's where it all started. And I've been working on it for many years since then. Yep, we're talking about offshore nuclear power stations, <laughs> admit it again. All right, so just a little background up front. Um, why exactly are we going to even consider this topic? And that is, as you all know, energy is very is essential, but our current sources are problematic. I think this is a very un uncontroversial point. Um, energy is a is a energy gives us freedom. It's a it's a replacement for the the labor and time of human beings. So low energy lifestyle, we kind of we are forced to spend a lot of our time getting food, doing the basic necessities of life, and given energy, um, that frees us up. We can use the energy to do the drudgery, and, and then we get to choose what to do with our lives. And so, and, and also it, it saves the, um, there's a lot of justice issues related to this. Um, even with like animals, having good clean sources of energy can save the labor of animals and, and other things like that. So it's just, it's really a, an important um, element of civilization today. And this is actually, you can kind of quantify this and you may have seen the human development index, which is a admittedly imperfect, but still quantitative measure of maybe correlated to quality of life. And what you see is this sort of really interesting shape where at the high end we have, we're here's the United States and the bubbles are proportional to population. You see that if we had a little bit more or less energy, oh, by the way, this is, think of this as quality of life as a function of per capita energy usage. So if we're basically saturated, if we had a little bit less or a little bit more energy, maybe it wouldn't change our lives too much. And a corollary, we could be more efficient and it would be okay, which we should. But then if you look down here on this part of the curve, you see this huge, um, very steep slope where just a little bit more energy can dramatically improve the quality of life. Um, they, they, it gives you again that choice to live the life that you choose. I won't say what life you may choose, but you get to choose. And look at these, the size of these bubbles. There's a huge population in this area. And so it's very important to, to enable people there to really expand their energy, maybe up to this green area. So you're talking about factors of two, three increases in energy over what we already have today. So <laughs> start with that um, and then say, where does our energy come from? And here's, the, here's a graph from the BP Statistical Review 2020. This was in 2019. So you know, over 80% of our total energy comes from fossil fuel around the world. Um, combustion of fossil fuel, which as you know, any combustion source takes <laughs> carbon plus oxygen to make CO2 and energy. So um, anyway, and then we have wind, solar, and biofuel here at 5%, hydro at 6%, nuclear at 4%. So these are the non-combustion, well, biofuels combustion. But anyway, these are generally the clean energy sources. So there's a huge, <laughs> that's a lot of fossil fuel is the, is the main point. And what are the problems with fossil fuel? <laughs> I don't have to tell you. But you already know there are two major problems. There's more, but there's two huge ones. The one, number one is the, the current uh, killer, which is air pollution. And um, I'm in Seattle. Um, 
many people in the United States don't really experience very degraded air quality, except maybe in fire season. <laughs> but many parts of many huge cities around the world have very unhealthy air quality. And, and the World Health Organization estimates that up to 8 million people per year are losing their lives because of air pollution related health problems. So it's this, it's a true, it's like a, one of the biggest public health emergencies It's just uh, combustion energy sources running normally um, causes a, a massive amount of, and then you hear the clean energy, you have hydro, nuclear, wind and solar with very few, almost zero relatively compared to the combustion energy sources. And that includes um, for nuclear, it includes nuclear accidents, for instance, um, it also includes construction and other life cycle things. So solar may be installers of solar um, falling off a roof or something like that. But anyway, it's basically zero. Hydro, I mean, dams fail and there have been serious incidents, but it's relatively rare. Again, compared to 8 million per year um, is the number we're, we're up against. And then, of course, the second problem is greenhouse gas emission. This is um, certainly a future problem, if not already a serious problem. And so here you have the same issue. These combustion sources make a lot of CO2 and that causes global warming. And then here again, the clean energy sources, hydro, nuclear, wind, solar are like zero carbon effectively. There's life cycle emissions, but it's very low. And that again includes um, construction uh, and, and the whole, and all the way, you know, it's cradle to grave. Okay, so that's the problem with fossil fuel. Um, so, okay, but but why bother with nuclear? I mean, we have, there's other energy, there's hydro, wind and solar, right? And, and hydro, wind and solar, to be fair, especially wind and solar are extremely popular for good reason. Um, they have lots of positive characteristics. Also, they have solar in particular has fallen in production price um, from, you know, by a factor of 10 and since 2009. So there's this uh, almost gleeful amount of, of headlines and, and progress and huge amounts of build out of these sources. So, you know, is that enough? And certainly there are people who say it's enough, um, but it's relatively controversial. And we're talking about decarbonizing, you know, in 10, 15, even 20, 30 years. Again, that magnitude, getting rid of <laughs> um, increasing energy for the world while getting rid of fossil fuels is, is a huge problem. So that's the main point. And, and here it is again. The magnitude of energy needed is, is more than, I think, um, is easily understood. I spent a lot of time looking at these numbers and trying to contextualize um, a quadrillion BTUs or um, uh, uh, exajoules of energy per year, which is how much we use, 600 to be precise. So anyway, um, oh, and by the way, population is going up to 10 or 11 billion. So serious, it's just that the magnitude of the problem is such that we need to be looking at, um, we need 10 times more wind, 10 times more solar, and 10 times more nuclear and hydro. Okay, and then some on top of all that. And another key point um, is that you may see headlines that say, hey, half of the energy or all the energy in the UK at this time or in California was from renewable sources. Well, invariably that's talking about electricity only, which is less than half of total energy. Of course, um, there's transportation, there's building heating, there's industrial process heat. And so when you look at it from a total energy point of view, you end up with a this really daunting, which is the same thing as that pie graph I showed before. Um, and some of these sectors like air travel, um, uh, industrial process heat are difficult to decarbonize um, even with even if you electrify them. Uh, add to that to the possibility of direct air ca carbon capture. So we may, we're at a point where many models say, okay, we have to start pulling carbon right out of the atmosphere. Well, guess what? That takes 250 kilowatt hours per ton. It takes a huge amount of energy to even consider doing that. And of course that energy has to be clean. So now you need another factor of two more energy worldwide. Climate change mitigation may require an additional energy. An example of that would be desalination. If there's water issues, you could always desalinate, but it's very energy intensive. So you need vast amounts of clean energy to make that happen. And I, we'll get to ships in a second. <laughs> Wild cards. Um, Bitcoin is at historic highs right now. And you probably know this, but Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency, you have to solve a very challenging but meaningless math problem on a computer in order to mine a Bitcoin. And it's very, very energy intensive. Um, you're just, you're factoring large prime numbers. Um, and, and the studies are, are talking about like Bitcoin alone, the emissions could push, you know, the, the amount of energy used uh, for that kind of sort of crazy thing is pretty gigantic. And so we've got other problems like this um, in, in central Washington by where I live. Um, 
there's a bunch of hydro plants out in central Washington and they have pretty you know, very reliable, cheap electricity. Um, and people build like uh, bootleg Bitcoin miners out there and the utilities have to keep an eye on it to like, because <laughs> they're using 10 or you know 50 times more energy than a typical house. So anyway, stuff like that is always going to happen. And then the last thing is about intermittency. So everybody knows, and you've all heard it, um, that intermittency of, of the renewable energies um, is, is a challenge, but maybe not too much of a challenge. Um, and I, so I just want to show this thought experiment. On the left, we have a, this is how much solar power was generated in the entirety of California on a winter day in 2019. So the sun came up around, you know, seven, produce this much energy and then set around, I don't know, five, right? So, and the this brown curve is the electricity demand. It's basically 20 gigawatts with eight gigawatt variable. And so the area of this little green thing compared to this big brown thing, you know, has to equal for you to have all of your electricity from solar. Um, and then I also slapped in with some assumptions, if you electrify transportation, heating and industry, you got to do that too. So the whole area, you can see the huge difference in area. And of course, people want energy in, in winter. The story is better in summer because there's more sunlight. But anyway, and so, so no problem. You just store it, right? Well, so to store it, you have to scale up the capacity until the area is equal. And so that's what's shown on the right. So we've now gone from maybe 10 gigawatts of solar capacity up to 175 gigawatts just to get this area to match the total area under here. And this is a this is sort of a no one actually proposes going 100% solar with batteries. There's always wind involved and there's hydro plants with pump storage and things like that. But the point is, this is California. Um, you know, you start talking about New England or parts of Europe um, and, and it's it's the challenge is daunting. It can be done. It's possible. But the, the environment. Oh, and by the way, everything up here has to be stored in this energy storage system, which takes which it uses resources. It uses land. It costs money. And none of those are in the, the current headlines that you see, you know, whatever's the cheapest possible. Well, that doesn't include any of the storage infrastructure. So so again, uh, don't be misled by by some of the the good news. Not just, I mean, be encouraged, but don't think we're out of the woods yet. There's a ton of work to do. I guess is the main point. So, okay, all right, let's talk about nuclear. <laughs> That's the background. So now, nuclear power is unique among the low those clean energy sources in that it's the only low carbon energy source that can run at full power without storage systems. Um, you know, for for two years in a row without refueling, without shutting down or anything. So it's very small footprint and it runs very reliably. So that's kind of the unique thing about it. In that sense, it's it's more, it's more similar to a, a coal plant in terms of how it can run its electricity. Um, you can, and, and they can actually ramp up and down. They choose not to, but they can. So it, it has some unique capabilities in that regard, but, but we all know there are problems with nuclear and let's talk about a few of them. So one of the major problems uh, is construction cost, uh, especially in the West. So as, wasn't, we haven't built plants in the United States for many years, and we started a few projects, um, and they've been boondoggles. So down in Georgia, it, uh, Vogel um, at Southern Company uh, has been a boondoggle. It's It's gone way over budget, way over timeline, and it's really not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a mess of a project. Um, and that, that story repeats in France, in Finland, there's similar stories where in, in Europe and North America, we just aren't doing well at building reactors. And this is a very a serious problem. If we want to make more clean energy with nuclear, well, we better be able to build them uh, on budget and uh, on schedule. Now, there is some more positive news, which is that in, in China, Korea, and Russia, um, nuclear plants are being delivered quite reasonably for, for reasonable costs. Um, and so we know it can be done. Uh, we just, we've, we've kind of forgotten how to do it as an issue here. So that's a serious problem. Um, and, and related to that, highly related, that is just how long it can take. Again, those, those plants at Vogel are going to take 12 plus years, whereas in China and Korea, you can get down to five years, but still, um, even, even, even in a place like Korea, um, where they have a very vertical, structure where the utility kind of designs, constructs, and then operates the plant. Um, it still uh, can take a fairly long time. This is this can be OK because you're going to run the plant for 80 or so years. Um, but still, it's, it's a challenge. So we'd like to bring that down. 
Um, okay, and then of course, concerns about safety and waste almost goes without saying, but I've, I do have to say it. this here is a picture of um, radiation dose rates at Fukushima after the event that happened there, uh, geez, almost 10 years ago. Um, and then nuclear waste. Uh, well, oh, I should, and, and these, and, and safety is a, is a serious concern. I mean, people's lives have been dramatically altered by this event. And of course, Chernobyl, uh, maybe you've seen the HBO miniseries or, or studied it through other means. Um, and so these are things that we really need to, to focus on um, eliminating. Now, that graph I showed earlier that shows that, well, fossil kills 8 million people per year and compared to that nuclear is, you know, no big deal. You know, it kills no one um, relatively. Um, well, that doesn't really stand, right? Because it's like airplane accidents. Like we know, everyone knows statistically that airplanes are the safest way to travel, but yet people are still... Uh, more afraid to get in an airplane because it's just a bigger, uh, a bigger event. It's 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 just it's scarier, and that's a real issue. Um, so, so dealing with that in some sense is is a sort of a necessity for moving forward. And just like airplanes, you know, nuclear reactors are highly highly regulated, and that factors into some of these um, construction cost issues. Okay, and then nuclear waste is another huge topic that I, I, I wish I could go into more here, but um, you know, almost everybody says, what about the waste? To the point that I actually bought the domain whataboutthewaste.com and redirected it to one of my, <laughs> my uh, explanation websites about it. But so it, you know, when you split atoms, it leaves the half atoms that remain. And those are radioactive material that need to be stored. Um, again, we can talk about it. Finland uh, is going to be the first country to turn on a, a commercial nuclear waste repository in a stable crystalline bedrock area. You put the this very small amount of waste. You can get all of your energy from nuclear for your whole life, and you'll make about a soda can or maybe two soda cans of waste. Toxic stuff, but extremely small compared to like a mountain of, of coal or, uh, you know, heavy metals or, you know, other things. Um so, but since it's so small, it's actually reasonable, and, and the geologists have studied this for years, it's actually quite reasonable to put it into a stable geologic region and it'll stay out of the biosphere for many years. And so the argument is simply fossil fuels killing us now, climate change is gonna kill us in the near future, nuclear waste, um, we have a safe solution for Finland's demonstrating it, so let's just do that. Um, and th that may not convince everybody, but that's, that's the basic case. Um, so we'll go back to that in the QA if anybody wants to talk more. Okay, so those are those are the key issues. And so now, finally, let's talk about offshore nuclear power plants. So why on earth would we take a nuclear power plant and take it offshore, right? It sounds crazy at first. Um, and everybody has, this, and when I first heard it, of course, I thought it was crazy as well. Um, having a power ship offshore isn't totally unconventional. This is a fossil fuel powered, power ship. Um, and there's several of these made by this company, Karadeniz, out of Turkey. And these things are amazing. They they roll in to a place that needs power, whether, you know, maybe they, there's a disaster area or they just needed temporary power because their power plant shut down or they're building one. And you, you, you roll it up, you, you hook a pipeline up to it, bringing fossil fuel out to it, and you run an electricity wire back to shore. And, and there you go. So this is like, and these are really interesting. Um, and so just imagine this, but but with a nuclear power plant instead of so then you don't need to run the um, the fossil fuel pipeline to it it just gives you electricity maybe uh, warm water and desalinated water and of course you know there's nuclear reactors all over the place in the ocean and there have been since the the early or the mid 1950s this is the launch of the uh, the Nautilus the world's first nuclear powered submarine. So this has a nuclear engine that makes steam and spins the, tur the spins the, the propeller and runs around, um, you know, and it can run underwater for this. Is, as soon as they made these, they started going on grand adventures. They went to the North Pole under the ice for the first time. They, they circumnavigated the world underwater for the first time because it's just such a, this crazy energy source. I um, mean, just a little historical fun fact. In 1907, Teddy Roosevelt paraded this uh, fleet called the Great White Fleet all around the world. It took him 14 months, and it was sort of a show of military might, you know, young, fledgling United States, young-ish. Um, and it, it, they had to enlist 38 coal freighters to, like, continuously refuel them. And, you know, people were out scrubbing these poor things. They were painted uh, white. <laughs> 
and then so but as a so once we had a nuclear powered fleet we had a, we have nuclear powered aircraft carriers we had some nuclear powered um, destroyers um, and this this fleet called task force one went on an operation in 1964 where they kind of did a, a reprise of that event and they went around the world on nuclear power in 65 days much much faster and they required zero refueling um, and they made zero air pollution so anyway it's just and here are the 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 sailors lined up to say exactly what force or what source their energy is coming from which anyway i just think this really emphasizes the the difference between a combustion fuel and an atomic fuel is um is really a, a massive improvement S side fact we've had merchant uh merchant marine ships as well the savannah was a nuclear powered um uh container ship anyway so so summary, there's about 175 nuclear powered vessels out in the oceans right now, uh, most of which are propulsion, um, which isn't the topic of today. But anyway, the point is nuclear reactors at sea is totally a done thing. And we, we fully understand it. And we've done it for many, many years um, with several incidents, but not nothing, I shouldn't say nothing serious, but nothing that, any, that many of you have heard of. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and, and, and in terms of power ships, I mean, these things do provide relief. Submarines do this. In, in, to, to, uh, in 2010, there was this devastating earthquake in Haiti, and, this, and the Carl Vinson rolled up in two days. They, and they started, they, have, they can make um, 1,500 or 150,000 gallons of desalinated water per day. And so they just started make, you know, reusing their nuclear reactor to make desalinated water and distribute it to this disaster region, which, again, is a... It's kind of a really nice and interesting capability when you have that kind of concentrated clean energy. All right, and to the real point, nuclear powered power ships uh, are also not a totally new concept. The Sturgis, here's a picture of the Sturgis at the Panama Canal. This is a barge. It doesn't have its own nuclear powered um, propulsion. It just has a nuclear power plant on it. And you can see these power lines. And this thing was used for sort of a quirk of a part of the Panama Canal that didn't have enough power to, to actually do what it needed to do. So they ran, this thing was running the Panama Canal for, <laughs> quite, for quite a few years. So again, this is the army looked into this um, and, and, and did it. Um, so anyway, that, the point there is that um, there is such a thing as offshore nuclear power already, or there has been. So, okay, one of the big benefits, and this may seem surprising, but we'll I'll get through it, um, is that there are some big safety benefits to being sighted offshore as a nuclear plant out in the ocean. Um, you know, imagine three to 10 miles offshore or so. So how can that be? Well, the most serious events that can impact a nuclear reactor are um, seismic events, and um, station blackout events, which is, and, and Fukushima is a great example of a station blackout event where the, the local power went out, went away. And then when the tsunami came through, it took out the backup power. Um, nuclear reactors need, once you shut them down, they still are producing a little bit of power. It's an afterglow heat um, that is significant. It's like 1% of the full power, which in a big power plant is a lot of heat. So you have to cool it. And when the, those diesel plant, those diesel backup generators went away as the tsunami came in, well, there was nothing to cool this afterglow heat and uh, it, it heated up and melted through its, uh, through its barriers and released some radiation. Now, so that's, a, that's one of the major events that can affect a nuclear reactor. And then again, I already mentioned seismic. Um, so when you're out at sea, you basically, for those two major events, you have um, two things. One is that you're connected. I mean, you're floating to a gigantic heat sink and you're, and you're buoyant. And so you can actually not need backup diesel generators at all and just use sort of the laws of physics um, and, and pull in ocean water through a heat exchanger and take it out totally passively in a complete station blackout and keep the temperatures below the level that is needed to contain uh, the radiation. And then of course, for earthquakes, um, you're completely, you're not on the solid ground. And so when the earth shakes, well, you're buffered. Um, you have the ocean as a giant spring, which protects you from earthquakes. So even though you have, you know, weather and things like that, the earthquake is much more violent event than any possible um, weather event, right? So those are, that's the major story. Like, okay, you have great cooling and you're decoupled from earthquakes. Like, you know, wow. Um, another thing is that 
for any you know worst case type scenario you know just imagine who knows what an asteroid or um a, a act of war or something um you still have a you have a zone around nuclear reactors where people need to have plans to evacuate it's called a emergency planning zone and when you're out a few miles at sea uh there's very few people if any in your emergency planning zone and so it's just farther away from the population and so if something does go wrong the radiation can dissipate before it reaches somebody where it could cause harm and that's obviously not something that we want to be doing all the time that we won't no one will accept if we have a bunch of nuclear reactors like out leaking in the ocean but again for like these worst case scenarios um which should never happen um there's still a reasonable plan which is that you're sort of you're in this remote area okay so um and then maybe tsunamis are a concern but as you probably know when you're in when you're away from shore the tsunami wavelength is many many miles and so you experience it as a ship when you're out at sea it's just the whole ocean goes up and comes back down and so there isn't this um, so you're even immune or protected from tsunamis. So there you go. Those are the sort of maybe unexpected, but I think interesting safety advantages of being out offshore. Um, and of course, there, there are disadvantages too, and we'll get to that. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I won't pull one over on you. Um, okay, so safety advantages is good, but um, I, I, the first problem I listed with nuclear was economics. And so... Here's where something gets really interesting. Now that you have a floating reactor, you can you build it in a shipyard in a shipyard construction environment, okay? And 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 that's really interesting. <laughs> and here's why. So, what, first of all, why is a nuclear reactor expensive? Uh, people have studied this, and and there's they're complicated, um, many different stories. But in general, you know what costs a lot in nuclear. Well, here's this big yellow chunk is just. The, the, the mortgage payments, the interest during construction. Uh, so yeah, that's a quarter of your cost. This giant blue one, and again, this is in, on the left is a conventional reactor in Europe or North America. And this is a conventional reactor in ROW, rest of the world. So, um, so this is what the problems are with the, the boondoggle, uh, the boondoggle projects that we're talking about the blue one is is indirect services cost so this is like people paying people like me the nuclear engineers and the other engineers it's mostly not nuclear engineers to do the services the project management the documentation the qa the compliance the tagging the the whole nine yards and it's just this massive amount of engineering changing things and checking how you know and anyway it's a lot of work um, and it can be much smaller if you have a you know repeatable um, well-established type construction environment. Green here is actually is the labor of construction. So this is like people actually out putting the equipment in place and installing it. And then this little brown thing is at the actual cost of the equipment, the pumps and the, the concrete and everything. So the point here is that these, the major bars, this one is proportional to how long it takes to construct and the capital cost. And then this huge one is really a function of like how once of a kind your reactor is. And so if you go into a very controlled uh, construction environment, you can see where this is going. You can basically serialize or turn it into like a Henry Ford production line of like huge zero carbon 24-7 um, energy sources, which um, and, and that can bring the cost down very significantly. Um, if you just look at a nuclear construction site, you'll see there's lots of cranes, there's lots of temporary equipment and facilities that have been built, and they have to be built at every single construction site. All of these cranes have, and, you know, they have to um, be moved around and it's just a, there's a lot going on. They're very big mega projects. But again, in a shipyard, actually, next slide. In a shipyard, here's Newport News, you have like permanent cranes. You have permanent equipment that does construction and the sites come to you and you send the site, the construction products out. And so like with one installation of crane and all the other equipment that you need, you can produce N um, products, nuclear reactors in this case. And so you, again, you're achieving this serialization in a very interesting way. So this is this could have sort of a dramatic um, impact on the economics. And here, this is building an aircraft carrier. And, and of course, there are nuclear capable shipyards that build our Navy vessels and things. So here's just a few pictures again at Newport News. Um, and, you know, this has been studied. So there's a group uh, called Lucid Catalyst, and they just in just a few months ago released this great report where they studied shipyard construction of nuclear in the modern context. And they found, indeed, that the direct cost can be um, reduced by 
25 percent and and the indirect cost can be decimated literally decimated so you know factor of 10 down um and and the the overall impact is that the cost gets chopped in half um, based on all the different savings you get by going into a shipyard environment and this is this hasn't fully been validated for like just power plants, but I mean, the Navy producing submarines has found um, economies of, of mass production like this for certain classes of, of naval uh, reactor products. So this is real stuff. Okay, so let's talk, um, let's talk about some challenges. It's not, it's not all um, sugar coated and whatnot. Offshore does have some pretty unique challenges. Um, one of the major ones um, is ship collisions. And you might think, well, just keep the ships away from it. But you know, there's a there's probabilistic analyses of these things. So if you have a really big ship which has a ton of momentum and it comes in and hits a structure that's moored somehow, um, you have to be able to deal with that. So that's like a new hazard. Um, and that certainly you want to design the system so that you can see all these little. This is a design from MIT. Um, there's a lot of um, compartments that can sort of that are designed for a certain type of collision. And then you have siting and regulations where you do actually try to say, keep stay out of the shipping lanes. And then um, there's various zones around here that people talk about having, you know, you would actually want to keep very large ships out of there. small ships, no big deal. But the, some of the very, very large ships can actually be problematic. So that's something you have to worry to a degree about. Um, Okay, so, and then, okay, what about weather? I sort of mentioned like weather, you can design a ship for a little bit extra money to um, withstand very intense weather. And of course, you know, there's oil platforms out there and you've seen the, the videos of those. Um, of course, staying connected to the oil well is a whole nother story, but I won't go into that. But um, the structure surviving serious weather can be purchased um, for extra money. And so for instance, like the Prelude, which is the world's biggest ship, it's 500 meters, was designed to withstand a, a category five cyclone uh, off the coast of, of Australia. Um, so weather, again, the, the ship itself will be a small fraction of the total nuclear power plant. And so it will make sense to spend maybe, um, not twice as much, but a little bit more than you would normally on just a, a commercial shipping ship uh, to make it very robust against weather. And then there is the concept of rogue waves, which used to be mythical. You know, is there such a thing as a rogue wave, which is like these, you know, very tall, um, 20 meter tall waves that can happen sort of from the randomness of the ocean. And then actually people have measured them, you know, just a few or maybe just one or maybe two. Um, so it's like a thing that can happen. It's very uh, unlikely, but um, it's something that would be in the design basis of this type of reactor. So that's another thing that has to be uh, analyzed and designed for. And then um, just a few others. I mean, icing is, is a problem if you're in cold water. You have to worry about ice building up and changing the dynamics, uh, the stability of your platform. Uh, something happening where you, you sink for some reason would be a serious event. Now, I would say that you could, um, and this would take work, but you probably could um, design it so that even if it does sink, and I would actually think this would be the best way to, to push one of these systems, even if it does completely sink, maybe from sabotage or something, um, it should sink in a, in a configuration that maintains that coolability, even if it's upside down or something, and then has a, a recovery operation where you go in and, and get it out and, and do a proper disposal of it. Piracy is a thing that you don't usually have on shore, so you do have to be concerned about that. Um, operators, you know, there's like a thousand people working at a nuclear power plant, um, many of whom are doing more... Um, <laughs> things that can be done in an office, let's say. Um, but still, there's people who are out there operating and maintaining the machinery. And so that, you know, of course, this is, you can do this, um, but it's a challenge. Um, say <laughs> a core melting through the hole is an interesting issue because um, uh, in the ground, you've heard of the China syndrome, you know, it goes down to China. Of course it doesn't, it just goes into the ground um, and then may spread through the ground. But in the water, it's sort of interesting because now it kind of, it both gets diluted really far, which is good from a health perspective. I mean, not good, but better than it being concentrated. Um, but also it transports farther than it would uh, on land. So that's that's sort of an interesting concern. And that you'll see in a second, um, did cause a, a design of one of these of the past to, to build in a really robust, they called it a core ladle made out of magnesium oxide. So even if that happens, um, it'll just sit in the ladle. Seasickness is a joke. 
Um, okay, so so given that, so there's problems, there's there's challenges, it's not all good. So you may be asking yourselves at this point, like, is this serious? Is this a serious proposal? Like, how serious could we really do this? Um, and so to answer that, I I'd like to provide you with the offshore power system story. Excuse me. I just need some tea. Offshore power systems um, was a joint venture between Westinghouse and the owner of Newport News Shipyard. It was started because in, in 1969 in New Jersey, the utility PSE&G just couldn't find sites for power plants. And they, be, they had predicted that energy demand was going to go exponential. And they knew that they were looking at brownouts. There's, they were going to have brownouts based on the demand curve going up and they couldn't find sites. And so they were in a real jam and they were somewhat desperate. And a, a lot of the big customers, there were actually oil refineries. Um, and so uh, <laughs> someone at the utility said, well, why don't we try going offshore? And, and they started looking into it. And sure enough, it was an interesting idea and the sites were available. And so they kicked off this effort that became, that's called offshore power systems. <laughs> um, and here's a picture of it. It actually has, these are two nuclear plants that are floating and then they have a break wall that they built around it. So it's in like 50 foot water as opposed to very deep water. Um, they actually did a couple different design options or siting options. One was this near shore one with a breakwater. They also said, hey, we could just produce these reactors in a shipyard and then shove them up against land. This was if there were more flexible sites, then you still could use a, a terrestrial site just by like delivering them to that site. And that's actually a more popular idea when it comes to shipyard produced reactors today forget about floating them for now just produce them in a shipyard and then deliver them to a land-based site and there's a few more options where you kind of backfill um the, the the land around them and still get those benefits of the shipyard construction so they they thought of all those and you'll see these reactors all look they're all the same module and and they they planned out the construction sequence and this is it i mean this is really um the, <laughs> they did a, a detailed design uh, of this whole process. And here's that permanent crane. Here's the nuclear components getting installed. Here's that gantry. Um, and here come the different rooms. You know, they're all prefabbed, you know, and they just get like loaded up um, again and again. And then they, it just moves down the line. It's really, uh, so again, not a new idea. So so how far did it go? Well, <laughs> they, they first did the full reactor design and sent in a safety analysis to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to get the reactors licensed. And then they sent in, they chose a site to produce these things, Jacksonville, Florida, out on, it's called Blount Island. Um, and they, they designed a production facility, a shipyard capable of producing four reactors per year, gigawatt scale reactors, like power, or the you know, power Los Angeles class reactors, four of them per year. So that's the kind of rate, by the way, we need for something like rapid decar deep decarbonization. Um, vast amounts of environmental studies were done. I mean, it was like, I think it employed more like oceanographers than almost anything before. Um, they, they did have a thousand employees working directly for OPS at one point. The world's largest crane was purchased and installed. They dredged, they they clean filled this whole area of this island. They dredged out the um, the area here to like produce the reactors. Um, actually, let's zoom in on that. This is, here's the reactors. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's the ones floating out. So the, this is the four per year. You, these, they're kind of, here though, here goes these guys to their site. And so anyway, you can kind of see that there's this big dredged area in the design. And sure enough, they did it. Like here's the facility, like they dredged it out. This is a modern picture of it. Um, and and the, the well, they didn't, they got very far in the process. It was a very serious um, situation. And in fact, well, get to that in a second and and reading the the reactions of the environmentalists who were working on this i mean this is kind of the modern era like the environmentalist movement at this time was in full steam and so these i won't read this whole thing to you but uh, the environmentalists were kind of saying like geez why would you build it there but as they worked on it and they studied it and they looked at the advantages um they they started changing their mind and they actually came around to it and thought this is actually a good idea i love this line and everyone in my group here is a professional environmentalist not a cocktail environmentalist self-appointed so um it's really um it's really interesting how these these people who were brought in to say like is this thing okay for the ocean um came around to it and that's a that, that happened somewhat 
a lot. That's not to say there was no controversy. There was controversy and there was opposition, of course, as there is with any uh, nuclear project. But um, and there were delays. Three Mile Island happened. Um, electricity demand totally zeroed out. They thought they were going to have this exponential thing. But, um, you know, in 73, there were oil shocks and the, re the refineries went away. They had no demand. Um, and so the the plant, the orders that the utility had ordered actually got canceled, but the OPS kept trying to go along and they actually got the NRC after much deliberation issued a manufacturing license to build eight units, uh, every eight, eight units in their four unit per year facility. So it went so far that they actually got a license to construct these reactors. This is mind blowing. And there's 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 these reports I'm showing pictures of there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pages of detailed studies of both the environmental impacts and also the design details and response to all the different incidents that could happen and so on. So this is a absolutely huge effort that could have been I mean, if this worked and and and, and had gone through like we would have I mean, we readily um, be able to start. Maybe we need a few more of these facilities, but that number of um, low carbon power plants per year is, is again, the kind of thing we're looking at uh, as we try to decarbonize. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up soon. So, okay, so that's the past. Um, that wrapped up again, it kind of shut down. They got the license and then they had to shut it down and like, I think they lasted until 84 or so before they finally were like, well, we have no customers, sorry. So it's a sad story in the end, but they, they got very far. So, all right, what about the, the real modern era? Like, how about right now? Well, believe it or not, there is a single operating floating nuclear power plant in the world. It is called Akademik Lomonosov, and it's built by the Russians. It is It was floated out to a very remote part in the Arctic Ocean to a village out there, and it now, as of like December, you know, a month ago, uh, it's powering this whole area, and it replaced a coal plant that was up there, and I think a small nuclear plant as well. So this is like, they don't want to be shipping fuel up to this very remote area all the time, especially with them when the ice is over and stuff. And so they brought in this um, significant, not gigawatt scale, but still relatively large uh, floating power plant. So there is one, uh, interestingly enough. And of course, uh, I have to say Greenpeace calls it something like the, the mobile Chernobyl or something like that, which is catchy, but it's really, it's not, it's not justified um, because again, of these, uh, of the safety advantages that I went through. Um, and of course, the not to mention the air pollution and climate change solutions. Okay, who else? So China doesn't have one, but they um, had they have published and announced um, fairly serious design efforts on on a, a 50 megawatt electric floating reactor. I I have not found. I looked very hard, and I haven't talked to anybody over there about it recently. But I haven't seen progress on this since about 2017. But, um, but this was a pretty serious effort they put a lot of work into. So that was another interest. Um, more excitingly, uh, just back in, um, let's see, October 2020, uh, South Korea, who, by the way, has the world's best shipbuilders and arguably the world's best reactor builders. Well, those folks got together and they signed a memorandum of understanding saying, hey, we're both good at what we do. Why don't we combine and maybe we can uh, design and build um, some offshore power plants. And here you can see a, a sort of preliminary design, but this, it's hard to see, but this is where the seawater comes in through this part of the hull and then goes through these heat exchangers. And that's where you get that station blackout, passive cooling um, protection. So anyway, so this is one of the more exciting modern um, efforts going on in this regard. In academia, MIT um, in 2014 or so did quite a bit of work, a couple PhDs, I think in a few master's projects and many papers on a spar type design, which is these, you know, you can see in the picture, um, more, you know, you've seen platforms that have this shape. And so here's the reactor way down here. And so, you know, this is, this is what was, this is similar to that one that was in the ship collision analysis. And so they've done pretty um, detailed analyses of different events that can happen. And, and they're pretty excited also. They're one of the, uh, they study the economic construction of nuclear power very seriously. And so here they are talking about this as well. Good old MIT. Um, and then here's Lucid Catalyst again, um, this group that did the, the shipyard construction work. It's in the same paper. Um, they actually looked at it as a 
offshore or shipyard constructed nuclear may be offshore as a source of clean hydrogen um, is a super interesting idea because when you have really high capacity factors, you can make hydrogen, um, especially if you have cheap nuclear, this is expensive nuclear, cheap nuclear, um, very low cost uh, hydrogen, but you do need to have what we call an advanced nuclear reactor. It can't just be a regular nuclear reactor design. It has to have higher temperatures. And there are many companies um, working on reactors that can reach those kind of temperatures. But once you make hydrogen, forget about it in cars, but um, you can actually use it uh, for many industrial processes. Um, and some of the really difficult to decarbonize sectors um, can, can actually be decarbonized with some kind of low carbon hydrogen. Of course, most hydrogen today comes from natural gas, so it's not clean at all. But if you make your hydrogen with a clean energy source, uh, especially a cheap clean energy source, then there you go. And here's their depiction of, here's a floating, well, here's a um, shipyard construction site with a bunch of small modular reactors running hydrogen. They called it a hydrogen gigafactory, which is a fun, uh, a fun term for it. And here it is. Here's a floating version of it, um, offloading the hydrogen in the form of ammonia, of all things, because it's easier to move around rather than cryogenic um, hydrogen gas. So um, anyway, really interesting concept there as well. So some interest, some big interest in, um, in, in the modern literature, let's say. And then there's a few other ones. There's these some smaller companies like Thorcon is a advanced reactor company that's run by like a ship, a guy who built ships his whole life. He's like a real ship builder um, who's really a cool guy. Um, and they, they talk about using shipyard construction to make very advanced types of nuclear reactors. Um, and then there's some other companies that have similar things as well. Core Power does marine propulsion actually. So that's trying to get back to the, like the Savannah. All right, so I, I, as I said, I want to leave time for Q&A. So we got through it. Um, as a summary, the energy issue that we're facing is, is very challenging. We are not close to solving it, regardless of those feel-good headlines, which I mean, as much as I like them, and, and not to say there isn't good progress being made, but there's so much work to do that it's really, and nobody's emphasizing it. I think it's important to really point out. And so we do have to look to things like this. And, and nuclear is a reasonable solution on its own. It's especially reasonable if you can find a way to bring, to, to uh, reliably deliver plants. Um, and, and if you can come up with ways to, to improve the safety as well. Um, that's, that's a positive as well. So anyway, I, I won't go through the pros and cons because you just heard them, but this is the, the summary and, uh, and let's go to questions.